and welcome. We are live. So previously, I was hosting the live um, guest uh, expert interviews inside the private um, private practice growth club Facebook group, but I have decided to move them all out onto the page so that those of, those of you who don't want to join the group can still have access to the videos. Having said that, as most of you know, I do also download the videos edit them and put them up on YouTube. So if you want to watch on demand, whenever you feel like, do go to youtube.com forward slash private practice growth club. You can subscribe, you can hit the bell for notifications and all the videos will end up there. But today, as promised, we are we have a representative from CFP Brokers and we are going to be talking all about liability insurance, professional indemnity, all of those things. Now, um, one of the things in the checklist for starting a private practice that I mentioned in the top five is that you must have some form of um, insurance. And today we're going to talk about the different types of insurance. It's not a, a, a legal requirement to have that in order to practice in private practice, but I say you should make it, your, make it an obligation on yourself to do that and not see patients without it. So hopefully today, Nolene, who is representing CFP today, is going to take us through the different types of insurances. I know it's very confusing. Um, also, where you can get it, what the advantages are, and some case examples where it's really been necessary. So I'm going to bring Nolene onto the screen. Welcome, Nolene, and thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you for having me. I'm quite excited to answer everyone's questions. So most people say they find this format really uh, strange because everybody's used to Zoom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's very much like Zoom. It's just that we, we are live on Facebook and it just makes it a little bit more engaging in that people's comments can be put up onto the screen and so on. Um, so I hope that people are going to be joining on as we go along. But um, let's just um, introduce you properly. So as I said, um, Nolene is a is a office manager and handles all the complex medical malpractice claims at CFP Brokers. And what is CFP Brokers? They specialize in liability insurance and carry out all the functions from new business, renewals, claims, and providing intermediary and advisory services. But I'm going to let Nolene go into more detail and introduce herself and CFP Brokers. So go ahead, Nolene. Thank you very much, Tasneem. So I've been at CFP Brokers for six years. I changed career track completely. I was in pharmaceutical logistics before and corporate, but here I am now in medical malpractice. Um, I'm still busy just finishing off my full qualification in the next couple of months, and then I become an, a key individual here at CFP Brokers. So fire away with your first question. So I think to start off with, Let's just talk a little bit about, about the necessity of actually having insurance. So as I mentioned in the in the intro, um, I have this free checklist on how to start a private practice in South Africa. And in those top five, uh, besides the things that you have to have, like your registration as a health professional, all of that, I mention insurance uh, indemnity. Now, there's a little bit of a confusion, first of all, between the different types of indemnity. So I know there's professional indemnity, malpractice insurance. I don't know, is it the same thing? Is it different things? Maybe you can start there. What are the different types of indemnity and why is it important to have them? Okay. So practitioners will need a combination of professional indemnity and medical malpractice insurance. So for me as a broker, for example, it's regulations that we have professional indemnity insurance. And the reason is because we give specialized advice. And if our advice is wrong, it can cause our clients a financial loss. So same with doctors and any kind of practitioners. They also offer specialized advice. And that advice can sometimes end up being incorrect, so a misdiagnosis or something along those lines. But then medical malpractice is a specialized type of professional indemnity. This is where the practitioner actually causes an injury to the patient or makes their condition worse or that kind of thing. So the one has to do with a financial loss. The other one has to, is the trigger is an injury. But they come together. You you won't you shouldn't be be getting a policy that uh, that's missing the one. The new buzzword that you will hear in the market is um, professional indemnity for medical practitioners or some kind of play on that sort of wording, 
all they've done there is instead of having two sections of cover separately, they've joined them together. But it's essentially much of the okay. same thing. Another okay. um, an interesting, important point you need to look at, and I'll give you a little example, is I always tell my clients, don't look at the marketing. Read the policy wording. Because, and, and I know we all hate reading policy wordings. Um, my clients just hate me when I tell them to do that. But, you know, it, it reminds me of my husband when he picks up a cereal box in, in a shopping center and he's so excited that he's found a healthy cereal because it's got on the cover all these <laughs> healthy people running and how many vitamins yeah. it's got. And then I tell him, no, read the ingredients. And he puts it down disappointed because the first ingredient is sugar. So it's the same with insurance policies. Read the hmm. fine print. Okay. So those are the two main yeah. ones, medical malpractice and professional indemnity. Then it depends on what, if it's a practice owner, we also recommend public liability. So that you would know, know more like your slip and trip type cover. I can hmm. give you an actual example that we're currently dealing with. So the patient went into the practice sat on the chair, the chair slipped, the patient fell backwards, hit his head on the brick wall and ended up in the ICU. Oh, wow. That is a public liability claim. And that looks like it's mm. going to hit 3 million. We're not sure because these things take wow. a very long time, but that could be a 3 million rand claim. So practice owners, please have public liability insurance. Then if you're selling products, if you're a, a, a if owner and you're selling products, then you also need product liability insurance because you're strictly liable for the damage that any product may cause to somebody. I mean, basically, me as a patient, let's say, I expect the practitioner, maybe my physiotherapist, if they're selling me a hot pack to know which is the right kind of hot pack, not one that's going to burst and mm. burn me. So I rely on their judgment. And so they need okay. product liability. Then you've got the practitioner who might be making custom-made goods, like an orthotist prosthetist. Public liability on its own is not going to be enough. They need an extension on their public liability called defective workmanship. So if that prosthesis is not made 100% correctly, the product is defective because of his workmanship is defective, he needs that extra extension of cover. So that so would include as well like OTs who are doing splinting, for example, or wheel issuing so wheelchairs, it, would it cover those? So if, if they are selling the wheelchair or providing a wheelchair and they, they would need product liability insurance. I don't, I don't think an OT is designing and making a product. Yes, well, so with hand, hand OT therapists, they actually manufacture the splints. So they measure the hand. Then they need yeah. defective workmanship cover added. Okay. Public li product liability on its own is not good enough. Okay. So if you are just recommending the product or selling the product, you're not manufacturing it or anything like that, then it's product liability. But if you have a role in, in the process of manufacturing or creating the product, then you need the defective workmanship work. liability. Absolutely. Because sometimes something goes wrong with the product and at that stage you're not quite sure was it strapped on wrong, was it a defective product. And so it's best to have what we call the four-in-one policy. It's one policy okay. that covers everything because was it a malpractice thing? Did Was it strapped on wrong? Yeah, was I was going to ask you that because what if, um, like, the, let's stay with the example of a hands OT and they create a splint and maybe the splint, um, you know, cuts into the skin or whatever. And then, like, who, who, like, what is it the product or is it the way that it was made and that's going into your clinical skills? Or maybe they issue a splint and then it, causes further neural damage because of the way the hand was positioned, then what, what, who is at fault there? The product or, uh, you, or your you clinical see, and, that's, <laughs> and that's where the, the, the policy, a four-in-one policy is excellent because you're not reporting to different insurers, you're not having all, you're reporting to one and then the, if it, let's say it becomes a serious claim, maybe the person loses the use of their hand. I mean, I don't know if that's possible, but it could. So then your policy would issue defense costs, so they would appoint an attorney subject to, obviously, what people need to remember about insurance product, any insurance product, is it's a contract. It's a contract between the insured and the insurer or the underwriter. And both have responsibilities. 
So that's also why I say read it because there's certain things you need to do as, as a client and as an insured. So when that come, becomes a claim, you need an attorney to defend you. You're going to need specialists to be able to say what actually caused it. Was it medical malpractice? Was it the product? Was it the design of the product? Was it what was it? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not so simple when, when the thing starts out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, speaking about the public liability insurance, um, I know this question has come up before when it comes to um, the whose who's does it fall under if you are renting property, for example, and the incident occurs like in the common property, not in your rooms. So like I can understand if the person slips on the chair that's in your rooms, but what if yes. it's like in the you know the the hallway and or just outside your your therapy room or it's to do with the actual structure of the, the actual therapy room not necessarily your equipment and that belongs to the landlord, the landlord. So who, who covers that, that thing okay so on the cfp brokers policy there's a carve back of cover for that that type of thing because it depends on the situation so normally common property would be the landlord's responsibility but you can't just leave it at that because i mean if if you're aware that there's crack tiles in the passage and you haven't mm -hmm. highlighted it to the landlord maybe he hasn't been there for a few months he could turn around and say but why didn't you tell me so they've got to take a measure of responsibility, even though they might not necessarily be held liable. But then you've got the other situation, and we've actually had it in our office park, where the water was turned off, and the taps upstairs from us were left on, and, you can, and it was over the evening, and you can imagine what happened, and then all of a sudden it was raining through the roof here, and so that was now the tenant's responsibility. That damage through our roofs. Fortunately, it just missed CFP. It only came into my office a tiny bit, and we've got steel cabinets here, so we were all fine. But our neighbor tenant, their computers were done. Their paper oh, files no. were done. It was a disaster. And that was now the insurance of the tenant because they caused that damage, not the mm. landlord. Mm. So the yeah. CFP policy covers that kind of thing on, on the scheme policy. And there's a lot of therapists who practice from the personal abode. So they have like a separate room or a separate entrance or whatever. What happens there? Because you obviously have your personal insurance, but that's not the same as public liability. So, so we've had a claim like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had all kinds of claims. So <laughs> in this instance, um, the patient came to see the practitioner and it was a windy day and she came through the side gate and the wind, it was an elderly patient, unfortunately, and the wind blew, the door closed and knocked her over and hurt her. Oh, no. And this so, was at somebody's personal home. The personal place. property where they had a practice, yes. Hmm. So now we need to always remember that when something goes wrong, it's not always the practitioner's fault. So now this was the wind. Mm. So was that gate, so then a whole lot of questions get asked. Was that gate too heavy? Was the, I mean, if a little gate, if it bumped, somebody wouldn't knock them over. So there's a whole lot of questions of how did this happen? Why did this happen? Was it negligent? Mm. Yeah. So yeah, public, if you're having a practice at home, you need to have the public liability. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I just want to mention another cover. I don't want to dwell on it too much because this would require a whole different discussion. Is with Poppy coming out is mm. cyber liability. Cyber, cyber, okay. cyber. But that we can bench that for another day maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think that requires a whole topic on its own. And I know, um, I think, I don't know what the website is called now. I'll put it in the comments uh, at another later stage. But there is actually a CPD uh, course out now that's, on that topic entirely on cyber you know keeping safe and um, in terms of ensuring yourself and your practice not not to do with products but how to to keep yourself from um 
yeah being <laughs> hacked and, and bre- yeah, oh. yeah data breaches and all of those things yeah and especially like i always say i hear all the time from healthcare professionals oh i don't like technology i'm not very tech savvy but that's not a good enough excuse because we love unfortunately we you can't get away from technology. Even if you are, have no Facebook account and you don't use WhatsApp and you have no technology in your home, at the end of the day, technology is going to play a part in your practice. The way you store data is going to play a part in uh, in your practice. And so you, you, you can't use that as an excuse. You have to kind of get out of your comfort zone and make yourself familiar with these these subjects. So yeah, I'm glad you bring that up as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um i think the next thing was um so we spoke about uh the different types of, of insurance and why you need it and sort of covered what does it protect you against so what i would like to know is um where does one go so i this is like a question that comes up in the in the allied health groups all the time oh where can i get um malpractice insurance um, any recommendations and then you get like lots of different people recommending different companies so I, I guess the question I want to ask is um, what should one kind of take into consideration because obviously you know maybe going to approach more than one company and get different quotes um, what should one consider in making your decision about who you're going to go with okay so let me start off with people think that there's a lot of different options when it comes to medical malpractice insurance there really isn't there's only a handful of underwriters and insurers who offer this kind of insurance and they won't all offer for example if i think of chiropractors there's two that i know of that that decline all so that leaves with about three or four underwriters so even if you approach five brokers they're all going to approach the same market. Okay. So we've all got the same mm. market to approach. So then the question becomes, what about the broker? So you get generalist brokers and you get speciality brokers. And medical malpractice insurance is just not the same as your medical aid or your car insurance or your home insurance. It's a very mm. specialized type of insurance. There's only a very limited number of brokers in South Africa who specialize in these products, but you will have many brokers, generalist brokers, who dabble in this kind of insurance. And I've okay. I've had quite a few that have tried to dabble in it, and then when they're not coming right, they come to me and they say, please help my client. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, get yourself a specialist broker. Another in- important thing is, as brokers, we need to declare if we've got conflicts of interests. So okay. you want to find a broker that is not, doesn't have some kind of relationship, like a monetary or some kind of relationship with one specific insurer. And the reason I say okay. that is because if you're going to have a big claim, in whose interest is that broker going to work? The underwriter or insurer that they they might have some kind of relationship with or they're insured so us at cfp Mm -hmm. brokers we deal with all of the different underwriters we have got no conflict of interest with any of them we expect them to treat our client fairly and if they Mm -hmm. don't you can ask them we give them big trouble but we generally only stick with those who they've got a track record where they've dealt properly with our clients we don't so maybe keep let's just those go let's let's just go back a few steps and then maybe you can rock, uh, um, give us a explanation on what is the difference then between because you're talking about an underwriter and you're talking about a broker so i think that also causes a bit of confusion i know even with normal insurance you go to a broker and then on your contract there's a different name of an underwriter and it's like confusing so <laughs> okay can you maybe just can I explain that Okay, so the insurers and the underwriters are not allowed because of regulations. We have the FSCA, just like most practitioners either have the HPCSA, for example. We are regulated by the FSCA, Financial Services Conduct Authority, and underwriters and insurers are not actually allowed to deal with the insured directly. The role of the underwriter, they rate the risk. They rate the risk, they set the premiums, they set the terms and conditions, they often are the ones who will write the policy wording 
Normally, not always. So, for example, CFP brokers scheme policy was written by Christy Carr. It's CFPs, it's our own wording. So, even if we had to move to a different insurer or underwriter, we would take our wording with us because that's ours. We've written it okay. specifically for our clients. But normally, the underwriter will, will write the policy and set those kind of things. The insurer stands be behind the underwriter. So if I think of, for example, I2, I don't know if everyone, everyone must have heard of I2. So I2 are the specialist underwriters for Hollard, the Hollard Insurance Company. Okay. Then behind the insurance company, so the insurance company is basically the one who pays the claim. They feel the pain. But the underwriter also feels a level of pain because they also take on some of that risk. Then okay. behind the insurer, you've normally got a reinsurer. And okay. they are often they often overseas. Um, and yeah, they they will give so because I mean often you can't carry all the huge amounts, so you reinsure certain okay. risks. So the insured, the client will deal with the broker. And the mm. broker does a lot of things. The broker will look for the best possible, they should look for the best co possible cover for their clients. They should explain that cover. They should, if there's a claim, they are the intermediary between the client and the underwriter because the, the, mm. there has to be reported. We have to give our clients advice. Often we, we've got to tell them, now these are the conditions of your cover. You can't admit liability. You can't make promises and on behalf of your, the, your insurer. There's a whole lot of do's and don'ts. So we guide the insured on how to manage the claim. We get advice where needed. And if there's an attorney that needs to be appointed, that gets appointed by the underwriters. And that's where we take a step back. As brokers, we don't have cl um, attorney client privilege. So we don't want to know too much because it hasn't happened. I haven't heard it happen. But one day we're going to have a clever attorney who's going to subpoena the broker for information. So when it's a very mm. serious claim, we generally take a step back and let the attorneys who deal with that kind of thing carry on. Okay. So it sounds like a broker is almost like your legal represent, not the legal, your representative. Financial representative. Like financial representative. So, yeah, I suppose if you think of it in terms of like if I want to invest and like grow my wealth, then I go to a broker who then will advise me on the best products to take out for um, retirement annuities and all of that and they like you said like you guys can't have conflict of interest they also can't have a stake in say PPS because then they're going to obviously recommend PPS to all their clients because then they you know so it needs to be in their in their best interest needs to be that their, their client needs to have the best product that's going to earn them the best return so a broker in insurance then it sounds like that's the same thing you are kind of taking up needs to find the best product or the best solution for your client to make sure that they get the best bang for, bang for their buck in terms of coverage. So I just want to add a little step here. So you've also got all of these scheme policies where, for example, we've got quite a number of them. So you've got an association or a society who so what happens with those policies is we as a broker, we keep in touch with that association and that association continually advises us if there's new special interest groups, if there's changes in regulations, if there's any new things that their types of practitioners are engaged in, or maybe they have got extra training, so now they can do, add to their scope. They keep us informed in, of that kind of information so that we can continually tailor the cover that's appropriate for that type of practitioner. If you're on a standalone policy, and I'm going to use a physiotherapist as an example. So your normal little physiotherapist who has their practice, for example, in a shopping center. If they take out a standalone policy, they will be rated according to that risk that they have at the time. But if that physio now goes and works in a hospital, that is what we call a material change to the risk. If you're okay. on a standalone policy, it's not a scheme. You would have to make sure you disclose that to your broker before you change mm. your risk because otherwise you're not going to be covered for that. So now this physio starts at a hospital practice and decides, you know what, on weekends I'm also going to offer exercise classes. That's another material change to the risk. Mm. So if somebody takes a standalone policy, they need to take the responsibility upon themselves to continually inform of changes in risks, changes yeah. in, whereas when you're on a scheme, 
you almost don't have to worry about it because the association is often doing that for you and the policy already has all of those special interest groups added because we don't know which physio we're dealing with. Are they in private practice? Do they, are they have a hospital practice? Do they do hippotherapy, which is treating animals? Do they do mm. aquatherapy? We don't know. So it's all on the policy already and it's rated. Okay. And we get a massive bulk discount. But when you're on your own, you've got to make sure that you always are covered. You can't just say any cover for physiotherapy because what kind of physiotherapy? And that applies across to all practitioners. So when you're talking in this example you're giving, that's what you're referring to is the association such as I as an occupational therapist belongs to the OT Association of South Africa. And so if I take out my cover as an atazamim, as part of the association, it covers everything that Otaza as a body. Covers. I don't know if that broker that and thing. Otaza have done their job properly. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> but but I suppose it makes sense in the sense that if you take so what you're saying is if you as an individual, as a private practice owner, or as an individual go and go to a broker and coverage, it's gonna be just for your unique needs. Um, so that's kind of like when you take out car insurance and they ask if your car is parked in a locked garage or not. So now if you move out. And now you, it isn't, yes. Yeah, maybe you take away your garage for some reason. You move <laughs> you need house. To tell them, yeah, so you you move house, then you need to tell them like these conditions have changed or maybe in your when you signed up, you said that you work from home and now you get a job. So now they need to know that you're on the road and you're working maybe Soweto or somewhere. That's what they need to know. So that's what you're talking about. Yes. So on the scheme, the, 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 anybody who's covered on, on our schemes are protected from that because it's it's rated right across the board for all of the special interests, for all of the... So the practitioner almost just needs to worry about if we've got a problem, that's when I need to contact the broker. I don't have to keep now okay. notifying of all these changes. Okay. Okay. So, so you kind of have to have a relationship with your broker in the way that you would have a relationship with your personal banker or your... Um, investment advisor or something like that where you can just phone them and say this is what's happening do I need to make any adjustments or mm, yeah if you understand a loan policy yes definitely okay so this is what I want to ask you because there's been a lot of um, questions that I've spoken a lot about like um, the different you know when you want to have a multidisciplinary practice or group practice so you register as an ink and then you have directors so just yesterday I was speaking to I had a webinar with company partners and we spoke about all the different um, sort of business structures that you can have so you could have a PTY limited for the administrative functions and have like multidisciplines own that but then you each have your ink or you could have an ink with all the same disciplines in and you all directors and shareholders. There's many different formats. So how how does liability cover then work for the practice in a situation like that? If you're just speaking about yourself, it's kind of easy because you just think, think of yourself. But who, how, obviously as an ink, the business takes out the, the cover, right? But you as an individual still needs your own malpractice insurance or, or what? Can you just speak okay, on so that? So it depends. It depends. So let's pretend for a second that I'm not dealing with a dentist. We don't have a scheme for dentists. I would then ask the dentist as a broker, do you want to cover your entire practice all and all of your em employees i'm talking about the professional employees so maybe he's employing another dentist a younger dentist do mm. you want your policy to cover all of your professionals and then that is what i would get quotes for or do you only want to cover your practice and yourself and each of your professional employees like the other dentist do you expect him to carry his own insurance so those are discussions that on a standalone you'd have to have when it comes to any of the CFP schemes, there is cover for the practice, but it depends. It's there's actually wording. Can I put the wording up, maybe? Yes, sure. Put them up. Put it up. Okay, so let me just get it quickly. So basically, let's say for example, there's five practice owners in the practice. Let me just go incorporate it. I just got to find it quickly. Because, I mean, there's a yeah, whole there other go. discussion and I do plan to get somebody to go into like the HR aspects of a practice because I know that there's a lot of people who are not running their pra practice ethically. Can I see to... what I've shared to make sure I've shared the right thing? <laughs> okay, that's exactly, yeah. Okay, carry on. 
Uh, yeah, so I was just saying that um, there are a lot of practices who are not intentionally but unintentionally being very unethical in their employment practices, especially when it comes to locums. And um, a lot of the times it's because, you know, they're trying to save costs. And that's a whole other issue which I will bring an HR person on. But at the same, like I can understand if you have permanent employees and you structure it in your account, you know, they will be covered under your insurance. But if you, a lot of people are employing locums and then the locum is required to have their own malpractice insurance, but then the way that they're paying the locum in the, at the end of the day, they, they sometimes end up like going on almost nothing because they, there's no benefits or anything like that. So that's why I think it's good if we can just speak about like how a practice in a group setting or when you have employees, how, how does that look and what do you need to consider when um, speaking to your broker? Okay, so on the, on the CFP scheme policies, here's the policy wording on of it. So you'll see section D there. It speaks of that any partnership, closed corporation or incorporated company will be an insured under the policy. But then it says provided that. Insurance policies are always going to say somewhere provided that. That's why I keep saying, please read your policy, whether it's my policy with CFP or, or you've got another broker and you've got a policy, please read your policy. <laughs> so now it is provided that in the event that any of the partners, members, directors are not insured through the professional indemnity, so it's on this per medical malpractice scheme, then with Hollard, then the insurers will only be responsible for the portion of the claim calculated proportionally. So let's say there's four practice owners. Two have cover on the scheme and two don't have cover on the scheme. So basically it means 50% of the claim would be covered by the insurer for the practice. Okay. The practitioner himself, so if he gets an HPC, HPCSA claim, which is normally against the practitioner himself, that doesn't affect it. But if there's a summons with the incorporated practice written on the summons and only two of the four are covered by the policy, the policy will only cover 50%. Okay. Yeah, I see. Whereas if you on a standalone policy, when you when you're on a standalone policy, you've got to fill in a very comprehensive form each year and you're gonna to have to declare this is the practice name, this is the practice, and then your broker will have to, when he gets quotes, specify are the is it just the practice covered? Are the medical professionals covered? Are the employed medical professionals are covered? That's all something that the broker has to not only understand himself, but then explain that so and there are some policies in the market um, that won't cover the employed professionals so it'll only cover the mm -hmm. owner and the practice and then it's actually a condition of that practice owner's cover that all of their professional staff have their own cover which means if your staff member doesn't pay for his insurance and it lapses and then you have a claim against your practice or yourself you're actually not covered hmm. Whereas okay. on this, on the CFP policy, there is not that condition. So if the practice owner is covered and the employed physiotherapist is not covered, the practice owner is still covered. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those are quite important things to know. I mean, um, you wouldn't think that when you're employing somebody and you're drawing up an employment contract that you need to think about your insurance. But that's quite an important thing to know. So you should be able to call your broker and say, look, I'm thinking of expanding my practice and employing somebody. Is there anything I need to know in my policy when it comes to, to the cover so that they can tell you something like that so that you can make sure in your employment contract that you can stipulate that a requirement is that you must have cover, um, just like you have a requirement that there must be HPCSA registered. And then it's your responsibility as the practice owner you can't say, well, I didn't know they lit it laps. You actually, just like with the Department of Education or you have to submit your HPCSA card every year, you could make it a requirement that every year, the, you know, your employee must show proof that they've got cover. Yeah, and what if they're paying monthly and now they paid for the first two months and then they stopped on month three? So yeah. it's, that, that's why we've structured it this way with the scheme policy, that that's not a condition, that whoever's paid for the yeah. cover has the cover. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's quite important, like you said, to read your contracts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up this thing about, well, what if they're paying monthly? I think there was also a little bit confusion around um, the, the payments, like, um, I think that uh, I heard on another webinar that most most um, providers ex, um, charge for a yearly amount 
um, and then this new insurer was saying, no, that they now offer it that monthly. I wasn't even aware that people weren't doing monthly. Or was I misunderstanding? Do Is there the option to pay monthly? Okay, so I can't comment on what was said there, but what I can say is on all the standalone policies with I2, general professional liability acceptances, uh, um, Camargue, and I'm sure there's a few of them. They do allow monthly premiums. Okay. Okay. On the CFP medical malpractice policy, we don't allow monthly premium payments. And if you think about it, for two and a half million rand for physiotherapists, for example, with the public and product liability insurance, it's 690 rand for the entire year. Mm. How much do you really want to pay monthly? Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was confused by that because um, I didn't know what, I mean, usually, yeah. and I think the confusion came in with because with the associations, um, um, like with Otaza, for example, if you join, or with SASP, if you join um, um, uh, the insurance screen, screen the insurance that is partnered with SASP, then you pay everything up front with your associate, you know, with your membership. Yes, in the past. And yeah, so you couldn't pay monthly. So I don't know if that's where the confusion came in, where as you're saying, you can't. So, um, and it was all bundled in. So, yes, so what would happen, what would happen yeah. with those is the association members had the option of paying EFT or monthly or whatever the case might be. And if they elected to take out medical malpractice insurance, then the association purchased that upfront for the member. And then let's, I'm talking about our schemes here. They pay, purchased it upfront for the member and then they would recover what they had paid. Okay. So I think you alluded to before, why do they have to now pay themselves for the cover, right? Yeah, so um, there was like a, so if the Otaza, I'm with Otaza, so Otaza sent out the mailer um, not too long ago saying that there's been some change in the way things, they're not allowed as because Otaza is not a financial services provider, they now not allowed to anymore take payments for insurance products. And then I saw SAS had the same message out. And then there was a lot of confusion in some of the groups around um, what, why is that relationship changed and will they still get this discounted rate being a SAS member and all of these things. So maybe you can just explain, like, so you saying that the association, like with Taza, for example, would take um, pay upfront on behalf of the member. I don't know what their particular well, I don't know. Well, but <laughs> with our okay. schemes, yes, they would pay for it upfront. So I'm going to put up our website. Let me share this because there's a whole lot of frequently asked questions there. And this is actually one of the questions we get a lot. Share screen. Okay. Share. Oh, why is it flashing like that? Wow. Okay. <laughs> so here's some of the frequently asked questions. And the one says, why have the payment arrangements changed for the medical malpractice policy? So there's the big answer. Okay. So only those who are registered financial service providers are allowed to collect premium. That has always been the case. Okay. But for the last 18 or so years, it's been the practice that associations and companies would purchase cover on behalf of their members and then maybe recover the funds or however it would work on their side. And that's been more or less how it's been happening for the last 18 years. But recently, there was a finding by the FSCA and that it was no law, that's not acceptable. So that's how law works. Often when you, you'll go to one lawyer and they're going to give you one opinion and you go to another lawyer, they're going to give you a different opinion on the same matter. And that's, that's, that's how law is sometimes. And so here was a clarification, you could say, for everybody in the market. Mm. And if you read this answer, so CFP brokers, we seek legal advice, we seek advice from the head of legal at Hollard, compliance officers, a whole lot of people. And in their minds, the associations were not collecting premium. But if, let's say, CASA or the SAS or any of our clients got a letter and the, and the FSCA found, felt that they were collecting premium, they would be found guilty and they could have a, a, a fine of, of up to 10 million rand. 
and that's a serious okay. fine. Mm. So we just we don't want to put our clients in that position. We don't want to. We will act cautiously. CFP. We always advise our clients to act with caution. And so in this instance, we said, okay, we will take on the responsibility of dealing with all the members individually. It meant that CFP had to make a program from scratch in eight weeks to cater for taking on members, taking on the issuing invoices, the whole. So this this site that you're seeing now is eight or nine weeks old. It was a crazy scramble to make sure that the associations would not get into any trouble. But mm. there's still the relationship between ourselves and the various schemes that we have and the, their associations. We still stay in contact. We still find out from them what are the regulations. Are there, is the scope changing? Like I know, for example, with the podiatrist, mm. their scope will be changing soon, it sounds like, that they're going to be able to write, do certain types of scripts and issue medication. So we keep in contact with the different associations to make sure that the mm. cover is always up to date. Otherwise, okay. if you're not on a scheme, you have to tell your broker, hey, regulations are changing. I'm going on training and I'm going to now start doing this. And that means you get re-rated. You might end up having to pay an additional premium. Mm. So kind of like how they introduced teletherapy now during lockdown. That that's is a new exact. thing that came in. And obviously with telehealth, that's a whole other kettle of fish that you need to be covered for. So yes. the insurance brokers needed to be aware of that. So that's an excellent example because I've, we've got, so CFP's got about 10,000 practitioners, about 8,000 on schemes and about 2,000 are not on schemes. So with the, the CFP schemes, we would safely assume that some would be engaging in teletherapy. So we added it on and I too didn't mm. charge anything extra, even though they took on an additional risk. They've actually even seen a claim because of that lovely risk but they didn't wow. charge extra. It was endorsed on the policy and it was added. And okay. the insurance, all the clients didn't even have to worry about it. It was just added. Whereas mm. all of my individual clients, I had to contact them and say, are you engaging in teletherapy? Mm. Yes or mm. no? If yes, how often? How many patients? What are you doing? Is it only existing? Like a whole lot of questions. Then that gets submitted to the, the underwriter and some underwriters will say to you, you know what, that's fine. We'll re-rate it renewal or others will go, mm, no, that's a bit hectic. I want this much more money. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so there's huge <laughs> benefits of being on a scheme. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now what I wanted to know is, um, this was asked in, in one of the groups before, that if you switch insurance providers, um, who cl covers the claim that originates from a client that you saw while you were insured with the previous insurer? It depends. So, yeah. <laughs> it depends. So I'll give you two different scenarios. Let's say that the practitioner now is moving their cover now for on January 2021, and they've had cover with the same provider since the year 2000. Now, on that policy, it depends because your retroactive cover date would be 1 January 2000, and you've been rendering services all along, no gaps in cover, no clue that there's a claim coming, you mm. change provider, and in January 15, you receive a summons. Next week, mm. you receive a summons. The first question your new insurer is going to ask you is, were you aware that a claim might have been coming? And let me tell you, they find out if you were aware. Because mm. the specialists are appointed, they go through all your records, you have to give your clinical notes, you have to, and there you have a little note saying the patient was complaining and not wanting to pay his bill, and, and, and. In mm. an instance like that, that would not be covered by anybody. And the reason mm. is, on your new policy, it's called a prior known circumstance, and your new policy will never cover prior known circumstances. Your old policy will say you have to report matters. And now it's lapsed. So now you can't come back running back and now try and report something. It's finished. It's gone. Mm -hmm. If it's true that, clueless, there was no idea this patient, no idea the summons arrived, then your new insurer will cover that because the claim is made when it's first reported. And it's first reported on 15 January 2021. The policy has the retroactive cover, so the new provider has to cover that claim. However, if in the, in 2000, 
you just had that horrible feeling that something was going to happen and it was a baby, it was a child, something went wrong and you just happened to notify your broker and you thought, and now it's set. And now when it comes to minors, they have a year after they reach majority to claim. So now that circumstance sits there and you better be with a, a provider that's in for the long run because so, for example, Hollard, they are long-standing medical malpractice insurer. Many insurers have pulled out of the medical malpractice market because it's it's a really tough market to stay in. Mm. So now that, because the claim was first made, you could say, or reported in 2000, it would be that policy that would have to cover that claim. It was so long ago that... An attorney is going to try and say that that claim is prescribed. That's what the defendant's attorney is going to try and say. And they're going to try and prove that, that it prescribed. Whereas the plaintiff's attorney is going to say, no, it didn't prescribe. He only became aware that the cause of the loss was three years ago because of whatever treatments he got or didn't get. Or it's just, yeah. So it hmm. depends. That's why when you change provider, that's the highest risk time for the client. You know, you okay. can change your car insurance. Today, I'm with insurance. Tomorrow, I'm going to be with some other auto in general. I, so I tell them, tomorrow, please be this one, please be that one. It's a nice clean cut change. I didn't have an accident today, and I had an accident tomorrow. The new mm. insurer was on risk. When it comes to these liabilities, it's not so clear cut. And you need to mm. make sure that you sit down and think very carefully about all of your patients, have you had any disagreements with them? Have they threatened you in any way? Have they really complained? You better notify that to your current provider if you're thinking of changing because you could end up so, in a situation with an unclaimed, uncovered claim. So it sounds like even if you aren't planning on changing, it's good practice to, if you have a disgruntled patient, um, even if you think they're not going to lay a claim or anything and go that drastic, you should at least notify. And I think I can't remember where I heard this. I actually heard this on a webinar or somewhere, somewhere that you need to in writing. So email whoever, I don't know if it's your broker. Is it your broker that you're supposed to email? Email yes. the person to say, um, you know, I just want to let you know that this happened with this patient and they're a little bit disgruntled. I don't, you know, this is the situation. And then if nothing happens, wonderful. But just in case, then at least you have a paper trail to show that you flagged it. Is, is that, would you yes. say that that's just generally good practice? So on all of your medical malpractice policies, whether you're with us or anybody else in the market, it will be a condition of cover that you notify a circumstance which could, and they often use the word reasonably, where, where the insured can reasonably assume that there could be a claim coming out in the future. So if they don't, it can be repudiated for late notification or for non-notification or whatever the case might be. So I'm telling you from all of them in the market, if I notify something a year after the patient was treated or two years after the patient was treated, the first question that I get asked by underwriters is, when did the insured become aware that this is a problem? And I'll give you okay. an example. Today I had a claim from 2017 was when the patient was treated. They had an operation. They had um, a hematoma. They lost function in the arm and the summons landed today and this poor practitioner mm. of mine had no clue that she was going to face a possible wow. problem oh that must have been so awful yeah so if so now that's fine we register it now and the this policy covers if back then she had had that horrible feeling in her stomach and she had notified it in 2017, then it would be the 2017 policy and all the conditions that apply to that policy that would cover the claim. Okay. Yeah. So, but now so here's always, another scenario. Let's say you're not changing for providers, but you decided to close your practice. And so you've canceled all expenses related to your practice, including malpractice insurance. You may be not going to practice anymore as a therapist, but you can still have a claim laid against you for during the time that you did practice. What happens then? <laughs> so that's the question you need to use, ask your broker because it depends on the policy. So, for okay. example, if you're on a GPLA policy, runoff cover is not automatic. In some instances, you have to pay for the runoff cover if they're willing to grant it. 
in some instances they don't charge you for the cover but you've got to elect to take it out every year and if you forget to take it out then you don't have it so that's a gpla policy you're not always sold runoff cover it depends on your risk so if you've had prior claims your insurer could turn around if you're on a standalone policy could turn around and say no we don't want to carry on covering you once you've retired or once you've sorry for you you end your cover it's, it's your problem on the cfp brokers policy there's automatic runoff cover so as long as the practitioner has cover in place until 31 december and they don't practice again next year. So you can't locum, you can't do, the minute you start practicing again, that one-off is, is nil and void. So you seriously, you're retiring, or you've closed your practice, and now you're going to start becoming an artist, whatever the case might be. Mm. Then the runoff cover, and there's conditions to the cover, so it depends how long you've had the policy for, you get given a certain amount of time runoff cover. So the longer you've been on the policy, the longer your runoff cover gets and you're okay. not charged extra for it on the CFP scheme policies. Okay, but I know now some here's others another charge scenario. You. <laughs> here's another scenario. Let's say you decide to leave private practice and go into public sector. So as a therapist working for the Department of Education or Department of Health, you're obviously covered um, not for malpractice, but I know there's some you covered somehow. You don't have to have your um, your, your cover on your own person. So what happens then is that you get a claim from when you were practicing, but you are practicing just not in a, in a private capacity. So that's an excellent question. I would have to find out the answer to that one. I would assume that mm, because you're, because the, 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 the state is not going to cover your retroactive cover. So I mm. would argue, see, that's where that's where broker becomes important. Because there I would mm. argue with the underwriter, but it's the same as you ceasing to practice because you're not in private practice. But actually, I'm going to take a note of that one and I'm going to have to answer. That's a mm. very good one. Yeah, I would say I that the runoff cover because, should work. Yeah, especially because there's a lot of private practice, you know, that maybe they private practice didn't work out for them. So they go back to full time employment. But also there's this new situation that's been happening now. So private organizations like schools are not allowed, like private schools are not allowed to employ um, an HPCSA registered practitioner, although Absolutely. there are some that are doing it without knowing yes. that they're not allowed to do it. Um, but let's say they apply for permission with the HPCSA and they do get that permission and they do it the right way and everything. Now who becomes responsible? So a lot of the cases, there's two different ways. Either they get permission and they employ the therapist on a full, like on a salary, as a salaried employee, or what often happens is that they employ the therapist as a contract worker. So I, as a private practice therapist, then treats the school as a client. So I bill the, therap the school for the number of, like retroactively for the sessions. And then the school kind of, kind of like with, with the schemes now in the association. So the school collects the payments from the parents and then gives it out to the, the therapists, right? As long as they're not profiting off of that. So, what happens then, because it's kind of tricky because they're not actually your employer, but they're actually your client, but you're using their premises, you, you know, you, yeah, it gets a bit tricky. So what happens then? <laughs> so my first, so I've actually dealt with a school that does this kind of thing. And the school said okay. to me, no, but we have medical malpractice insurance. I said, what is the scope of your medical malpractice insurance? No, we have medical mal. I said, I want to see your policy. So their okay. policy had what is known as incidental medical malpractice. Okay. So many people think that it's only practitioners that need medical malpractice insurance. It's not. It's anybody whose services can injure or cause damage to somebody else. So that incidental medical malpractice is for when the child falls and the teacher now goes and washes his knee and puts something on it, and then the child has an allergic reaction. Hmm. That's okay. what it means incidental. Incidental. It's not the school's okay. real risk. But you that see, incidental yeah. medical malpractice does not cover the practitioner. And this is where many people, many, many think that it does. It does not. Hmm. So unless the school's taken out a specific medical malpractice policy that covers the practitioners, that practitioner is not covered, which means if they have an HPCSA complaint against them personally, they're on their own. If they have a, a 
a civil claim, it's unlikely that the school, especially if the school thinks that this practitioner has been negligent in some way, that practitioner will be footing those legal fees on their own if they haven't taken out their own medical malpractice insurance. Mm. So if the school is saying to them that they've got medical malpractice, they need to be able to double check what exactly is that medical malpractice mm. and does it cover me? And they need to ask that question to their brokers. Does it cover Dr. So-and-so or therapist so-and-so? Hmm. So um, this is quite important. I don't think most therapists think of that. And there are so many who want to go into pediatrics and instantly they think of schools. Um, and and that's not something that anybody, I think most people probably don't even consider that. So you that's that's quite important to know, especially when you're dealing with the you know kids as a population, because so many things can go wrong with kids. <laughs> so so then in that situation, you need to find out that if if the poli their policy doesn't cover, then you need to take responsibility and take out your own separate cover then. Yeah. So we've got some exciting news for occupational therapists, speech therapists, podiatrists, psychologists, quite a few, is that CFP has opened a non-affiliated medical malpractice scheme. It opened on okay. the 1st of December. And at this, for the first year, it's going to run for 13 months. So it's already opened. We're waiting for the exact policy wording. So if anyone wants to know more about that particular policy, then they're welcome to contact me directly. I will be on leave for the next couple of days. But they can also contact Lauren or Catherine at our offices. Because it's really not that expensive to get on a scheme. You must remember when, mm -hmm. when we've got a few thousand practitioners pooling their premiums together, on a scheme, you get a massive bulk discount from the underwriters because mm. not every single practitioner on that scheme is going to have a claim. Mm. So it's, it's rated on what we call a loss ratio rather than on the individ each individual practitioner's risk. So it's rated okay. completely differently. And so it's quite funny, actually, we've been having in the last few days people taking out cover on the schemes and then phoning us that they want to increase their limits because they thought the premium shown was the monthly premium, but it's actually the annual premium. And when they get a once-off invoice, when they get a once-off invoice, that yeah. looks, they thought that was the monthly amount. I'm like, no, that's the whole annual amount. Yeah, especially like when you watch these um, ads on, uh, you know, the iTunes ads that say, I saved 1,500 data of insurance and like that's what they're paying monthly <laughs> so that's what you expect you're gonna pay every month yeah we've had so <laughs> many of those in the last few days yeah so so let, let's go on to that now because we 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 about to wrap up now so somebody now people somebody is watching this and they decide okay they'd like to now speak to a broker they don't have any insurance or they do have insurance or whatever the case may be what do they need to do they need to contact um CFP brokers and say they want to get onto a scheme. <laughs> yes. So is okay. that what they need to ask? They... Yeah, so what I'm going to show you on the screen. Okay. Let me um, stop sharing and then share. You must make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Okay, there we go. Are you seeing the one that says medical? Yes. Okay. Yes. So CFP brokers, if anyone wants to take down this address, it's cover for the numeral profs.co.za forward slash malprac forward slash. This is our main page. It shows you all of the different medical malpractice scheme policies the CFP brokers has. So my recommendation would be first go and click on the relevant association or if you're one of those practitioners and then have on most of them so from the associations one the premiums are shown on this on that when you click on it it gives a brief explanations of the cover um the excesses it tells you quite a bit which i would tell you anyway as a, a broker so first you have a read of that and if you're interested in that cover absolutely we are here phone us email us ask us questions about it we, we also offer if if you've got competitive quotes and you're not too sure which one is the best way to go, we say send us a copy of your quotes and we need the wording. I always stress this. Sometimes mm -hmm. the quote might say one thing, but when you read the wording, it says something else. And I'll give you a prime example. So some more than one actually underwriter in the market is is offering cover, which looks brilliant. But what I really don't like about it is that the, the excess is a percentage of mm. the claim. 
So it says, for example, your excess for public liability is 2,000 Rand or 1,200 Rand. And then it says min, comma, 10% claim. Now, most people mm. don't quite understand the implications of that. So let's think back to my one where the practitioner had the patient fall off the chair and it might be 3 million Rand. Mm. If you're paying 10% of that claim, you're paying 300,000 Rand. Mm. Yeah. So whether when I am getting quotes from my standalone clients and one of the underwriters or two of the underwriters come back and they've put a percentage of claim as the excess, I generally tell my client, I do not recommend this policy. And the reason is if you have a claim, how are you going to budget for the excess? Can you afford mm. that excess? If you mm. can't afford that excess, don't take that policy. Yeah. And how because, would you know also? Because it might be 10 million and then it's 100. Like it's 10 million. And then how do you know how much somebody's you claim don't is going to know. be? So how do you know? There's no budget. way of planning that. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, even a small, we call a small claim, a 500,000 rand claim, you're still paying 50,000 rand excess mm, mm. if it's a 10% of claim. I'm like, yeah. so no, 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 no. If you see a minimum excess, my, my recommendation is is don't don't go there. Yeah. And unless you've got extra money in the bank and you're willing to just keep it there for that one day. <laughs> uh, now, we didn't really go into this. I don't know if we have time, but... Um, uh, I don't know where I heard about this, about somebody who was asking about short-term cover. I don't know why you would need a cover for a very short period of time. Is there such a thing where you, or not? Because I mean, if you're paying for the year, paying for the year. Okay, so these are called short-term policies and that's because they run for 12 months. But you need to remember that how they're offered. They're offered, it's very different to the MPS. So let's speak about the MPS for a second. MPS is not an insurer, it's a friendly society. And they, for most practitioner types, they are changing, but for most practitioner types, they offer cover on what is called a losses occurring basis. So it means okay. when you were the member of the MPS, as long as you remember when you performed the, the surgery or the service or whatever it was, you were covered. So if you only worked between in 2015 and then you didn't work in 2016 and then you worked in 2017, you can have membership at those times. It's okay because you were covered at the time of rendering the service. That's the okay. MPS normally, unless you are one of the higher risk practitioners, then they've moved it to what is called claims made cover. Now claims made cover, you need to have cover in place at a few times with no gap. So you need to have cover in place at the time you render the service. You need to have cover in place at the time you become aware of the possibility that there might be a claim against you. And that is when you make the claim. That's when you tell your broker. So there's often a lag between those times. You don't always know straight away. Sometimes you do. Like a chiropractor or physiotherapist who causes a pneumothorax, they know quite quickly that either in the practice the patient's got chest pain and struggling to breathe, or that evening the patient phones saying, I'm in a lot of pain, and all the next morning I'm in hospital. Those are quick. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's situations where six months can pass, a year can pass before you know, or like today's one, three years pass before you know. Mm -hmm. So you need to have cover in place when you render the service and that whole time lapse until that claim is notified. So you can't, if you're a locum, take out cover for six months now and then have a gap for a year and then six months again and then because you actually don't have cover if that claim mm. comes later. You've got gaps, you're not retaining your retroactive cover. So the key is you need to retain your retroactive cover, which is your backdated cover. You need to have ongoing cover and only if you permanently cease to practice and your policy has runoff cover, then you stop the, the cover and you can you need to tell your broker, I need the runoff cover. In our case, we've always just assumed if somebody stopped paying that they were on runoff. So we just put it there just in case on runoff, but they would have to then, if they had a claim, prove that they had stopped practicing to be entitled to mm. that. And in other cases, if you're on policies that don't offer the automatic runoff cover, then before you stop practicing, you say, I'm stopping practice on such a date, I need runoff cover. Mm. But you can't, okay. you can't just, you can't have little bits of cover. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so thank you so much for your time. I think I also want to just end off by making it absolutely um, clear that um, all these different types of cover is is um, a monetary cover. So 
it doesn't protect you against any um and you can correct me if i'm wrong here so if somebody lays a claim through the hpca against you and um the hpca rules that you are you know you'll be struck from the register or they you it's not that bad you aren't stuck in the register <laughs> but, um you know your behavior wasn't desirable and so uh, you don't get like you know that certificate of good standing will always say was found guilty of and people don't even know that there's, there's, there's a thing like that yeah and you get a fine so you don't you aren't covered for for those kind of against those yeah. kind of things or representation with the HPCSA, that's something entirely different. It's well, more kind of recover. It depends. It depends. Okay. It depends. So, depending on the policy, many will have a regulatory body or an HPCSA extension on them. Again, you need okay. to read the wording because it depends on the policy. Most policies in the market will only cover HPCSA cl complaints and that's when they appoint an attorney to help with the the insured to answer the HPCSA, they'll only cover it if there's a possibility of a medical malpractice civil claim arising out of the situation. Most say okay. if there's not a pos possibility for malpractice, if it's touting or billing or mm -hmm. ad, you know, all that kind of non malpractice type stuff, the policy won't yeah. cover. The CFP policy, okay. however, says regardless, if it's an HPCSA complaint, your reputation's at risk, we are covering those. Okay. What okay. is not covered is the fine. So here again, you've got okay. to be careful. Don't look at the pretty serial packaging because you'll see a, a, a quote that says fines, defense costs. So, so they tend to think, oh, my fines are covered. No, it goes against okay. public policy to cover fines. Fines are never covered. Mm. Those defense costs, which is also included in the CFP, is if the practitioner wants to appeal the ruling. Okay then the insurer's attorneys usually will have a look at the case and they will look at, is there a good chance of winning the appeal or isn't there a good chance of winning the, the appeal? Okay. And then they will decide whether they should proceed or not proceed. I've had quite a few go on appeal. Um, yeah, we've got actually a whole lot at the moment on appeal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that at the end of the day, this cover is really necessary because you never know what, bad luck you might have but at the end of the day you still need to make sure that you are well aware of what the HPCSA guidelines are with regards to how you practice especially when it comes to like you say the non-malpractice things like marketing your business or the way you employ people or the way you're paying or commissions and all of those incentives and things like that Be, to try as much as possible be clued up on what the ethical guidelines say about being in professional practice so that you can avoid these kinds of things from happening because I'm sure nobody, nobody wants it to happen. So, no. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think it was really valuable. We had a, quite a few people jump on and off. Um, and But as I said, I will be putting it up onto YouTube and with all the contact details, the website, phone numbers, all of those kinds of things. Um, so people can just get hold of you if they need to get cover and <laughs> any other information that they, that they need. Thank you so much.